The one thing I thought I'd like to ask about is um, individual and collective creativity. Um, so I think often we think of creativity as something that you, you do on your own, but uh, there are lots of areas where we work with other people. So obviously theatre, mm -hmm. film, moving a band, those are all examples of that. Derek, I suppose you're probably working in the closer to sort of individual creativity um, realm. Um, how does that work for you? Where, where do you, you mentioned ideas, where do ideas come from earlier? Um, because I'm getting on a bit now, I've worked in lots of different areas. I have worked in the you know, street theatre scene, you know, I'm talking sort of 40 years ago, when uh, uh, doing community projects where you're working with people and you, you just try to tease out of them things they didn't think they could do or, or, or present them with something that they understand, but in a different way. And how do you stimulate that excitement, whatever. So I work, worked with people on that level. I've worked musically with people. You know, here's some lyrics, put a tune to this or the other way around, or, uh, you know, um, <laughs> I, I do tend to go off at a tangent. So what you're saying, Terry, you keep saying, oh, I've gone off at, at a tangent again. Well, that's really important. Tangents are really important because they, they show things in a in another way, and that's all an artist is doing is is pointing at something in a different way. <laughs> you go, oh, look at this. Even if you just take a picture and show it to somebody, you're saying, look at this, um, and they say, oh yes, I never thought about that like that, you know. Or uh, so it, it can be that sort of light, or it can be more intense. And working on my own, I. Uh, I like to bounce off people, but they don't always get it. So I'm sometimes I'm, although with people, I'm on my own. But <laughs> you know, I had this thing about uh, what's interesting is you know um, uh, over the years I've got more and more into writing songs and um, uh, doing ideas through words. But I've got a history of being quite severely dyslexic, and you're talking about Terry. You're talking about the autism thing. And autistic people look at things in a different perspective. Dyslexics do the same. If you can't spell a word, you look for another word. So you have to go through a process where you have to think, what am I trying to say? I'll use this word because I could spell this word, but does it mean the same? So you think about words in a different way. And uh, uh, in my school life, I got very hung up on um, <laughs> words in English. And uh, although I'm now, qualified teacher, <laughs> uh, a certificate teacher, I still don't have my English <laughs> O level. There you are, it's out now. <laughs> um, I retook it when I was at school and I took it nine times and I never got it. And the joke was that I was gonna write to the Guinness Book of Records, but I couldn't spell Guinness. So <laughs> the whole thing about words, held me back and then as I was I became uh, a performer and singing songs and writing songs the first time I wrote a song and sang it to an audience and they laughed I thought I can do words I've been told all my life I can't do words and I'm you know dyslexic and there was somebody on Radio 4 um, last week talking about celebrating dyslexia and celebrating these things um, and all it is is uh, looking at things from a different point of view I mean it's that's a simplistic analysis, I know, but uh, I have a song on an album. I made um, a, a BBC drama. I did the music for, for this drama about an autistic man from Stoke-on-Trent. He's called Neil Baldwin. I got to know him quite well. And uh, I did some recording with him. Uh, he's not a great singer, so he spoke all the lyrics. <laughs> but I wrote him a song, which was, uh, it's called We're All on the Spectrum which uh, kind of acknowledges that we're all individuals and we're all a bit cranky and we're all a bit this and we're all a bit that. And, and what's happened within the system is they put labels on things, oh, he's dyslexic. And so we've got to cure the dyslexia or we've got to... <laughs> well, I'm quite proud of the fact because I've used it. I've used my quirkiness, if you like, whatever you want to call it, I don't really care. 
and and so I, I've had to think things through in a different way on my own. So shall we go over to Terry Ann? And yeah. so so you're obviously working in theatre, which is a much more obviously collaborative area. Yeah. And I mean, particularly with Tell Be Told, you're working with people to encourage them to develop, to express themselves, express their own creativity, I would think, aren't you? Um, yeah. So can you tell us a bit about how that works? And do you have certain techniques that you find, you know, work to help people do that? It varies really depending on the project. Um, sometimes the element of our, our engagement with them is them sharing their story um, and then we take the story away and we'll work on it for a bit and then we'll invite them into the rehearsal process um, so that they're happy with the story we're telling. It's their words. We, we never want to you know, offend anyone by the way we represent them. Um, and then again, the play happens and they'll come and see the play. And we always think that for us, the play is an evolving thing. It depends on what we get back from the audience when they watch it. Um, our performances, as I said earlier, they're always interactive. So we're, we'll make sure that, um, that the audience are part of the performance a lot of the time. Um, so in the show we did about housing, we were getting members of the audience up at points and they were on the stage interacting moving around I've just heard my children go a bit wild in the background so um yeah so it can it can be different really and then we we've worked with lots of young people um in the work we do um and that very much is about getting them to get to the stage that if they want to that they're ready to perform their own words and that's that's um quite an ideal for us that it's not us saying, oh, these are your words and this is how we need to present it. It's them shaping their own story and deciding how that story is going to be told. So um, we did a project a couple of years back with young carers. Um, and it was really important to us that um, after speaking to them in the really early stages of the project, um, they completely transformed the project for us before it was about, you know, oh, they're so hard done by and we need to make sure they're everyone knows how hard done by they are so we should look out for them and you know on the first day that we interacted with them they, they said we're so fed up of people thinking we're hard done by we don't want anything like that and it was like oh, okay so then the, the performance of what we expected completely changed because they told us from day one and I think from the get-go for us it's really important that it's shaped by audience first um, and that we're really representing their stories properly. Sounds like you're facilitating it's yeah I'd say there's a, there's a huge element of facilitation to it um but it's it's just trying to let it be organic and not be too structured with it and not be you know to really I think me and Cole Raj we do work really well together and, and we'll feed off of where it's going and we'll you know if if we feel that oh the direction that we've planned isn't quite working right let's let's jump and do something else or somebody from the audience or somebody um, from a group we're working might bring up something that we hadn't even thought of and then it's we'll quickly jump to that okay you know what we'll explore that I, I mean I remember a couple of years back we were doing a show and it was a community show about um, the history of Feltham and it was really largely based on people's stories and we had this um, we had this lady in the audience and she she was so engrossed and there that she was getting into conversations with us and I think you know, it's, 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 it would be really easy as an actor to get above your station a bit and think, oh, you know, you're not supposed to interrupt my performance, I'm performing for you. But, but you know, we embraced it. And while we, you know, there was one bit where I was talking about, oh, this happened outside this Tesco's that was there. And the woman sort of spoke up and went, oh, yeah, yeah, the Tesco's that was on the corner. And, you know, instead of just trying to get it straight back to our script, um, you know, we encouraged that conversation and we, yeah, yeah, that one. Do you remember how they had that? You know, it's but it means that you have to be very flexible. Um, mm. And we have worked with actors actually that it's it's quite a skill in itself to be able to, to respond. Some actors have to have that script and they have to stick to exactly what the words say and they need to stick to what the words say. And that's fine, there's there's a place for that. But um, but in our style particularly, you have to be able to improvise, you have to be able to go with what you're given. Um, so we try to do that really. Working yeah. with the tangent. The there's method. always tangents, there's yeah. many, <laughs> many tangents in our work, but it, we try to embrace the tangents. Cora, it's good that we're a pair actually, because I'm the one that tends to go off on a tangent and Coolraj will say, 
you've forgotten what the question is, haven't you? And I'll... <laughs> yes, yes, I have. I mean, this is something I really wanted to ask because you know what? I feel like I've never really quite understood what a producer does. Um, yeah. So can you can you settle it? What's the difference between a director and a producer? Ah, well, I tell you something. The pro the producers, most producers, are stressed out, <laughs> and um, because of the amount of responsibility that falls on their sh their shoulders from a holistic perspective, pretty much making the project come to life is the producer's role and the producer's team's role. Um, the it's not to uh, sort of uh, say that the director doesn't have that same level of responsibility, but it's more uh, centered and around the storytelling. Whereas the producer sort of has to manage the, the, the bigger picture and the project at large. Yeah. And so there's a lot of um, paperwork involved, a lot of rights clearances. There's a lot of things that sort of administration wise, which doesn't seem or feel like it should belong in anything creative when you've got your creative hat on. But in order to sort of afford the freedom to be able to do the, the creative work, that a lot of the producer work sort of takes place there. And the other thing that a producer's role has to do is sort of look at the realist, realism and the, the realistic ways in order to achieve the creative vision. And so a lot of it is people. A lot of it is people management. A lot of it is understanding how people work. And they're coming up with processes that allow everybody to have as good a time as possible. Uh, a good producer will make sure that everybody is having as good a time as is possible. Uh, a, a producer that's performing badly is getting the job done, but people feel miserable and, and feel like it's work. Um, and that for me is the difference between a good producer and a bad producer, just between a producer and a director is they share the same vision. They want to have the same thing happen, but the director focuses more on the on the, uh, the way the things that are gonna be seen on the screen are gonna come together. Whereas the producers sort of just outside of frame, moving all of the potential hazards out of the way, so the director isn't interrupted. So that the audience never gets to see any of, of the craziness that was happening just outside of that screen. And so the producers dealing, I mean, it, there's obviously a lot of money involved. It costs a lot to create um, a TV show, for example, doesn't it? Um, and there are going to be interests of funders, studios, whatever, all sorts of people involved. Um, and I guess the producers dealing with all of that. How do all those uh, considerations um, kind of impact the creative process, do you think? Um, similar, similar to what Terry Ann was saying, actually, in that there's the, where, where Terry Ann was talking about, you know, being mindful of the audience and being mindful of the people you're collaborating with so not to offend. There's a great deal of diplomacy uh, in collaborative work, and it's no different in producing a TV or film series. When we're aware that we can listen to people's ideas, suggestions, advice, solicited and unsolicited, we can um, carefully tread with diplomacy to make everybody as happy as possible whilst seeing through the, the writer and director's vision for what they want to have um, come on screen. And so there's an element of trust that has to be there. And, um, and I think this is true for, for all areas of collaborative art. I think that, you know, if you're working with a partner and the, you don't trust each other's decisions, then you're going to micromanage everything. And at some point things will fall apart. Whereas if you have that trust, you allow everybody in the team to take charge and uh, there's sort of, you take your foot off the pedal a little bit. And I think there's a great a deal of confidence that comes overall. And I think overall, from my experience, the creativity of the project breathes more when we are less worried and, and uh, more trusting. 